Are you guys ready? Third week. Next week is the last week of the breaking of a champion. Um, I'm going I'm to review with you just for a second because I think this is so important. Um, because God is looking for men and women who are going to be champions for Christ. And the world's going to define a champion because the, and I coach sports, but the, the world idolizes sports. So we get very fo- focused and fixated on who wins the NBA championship or who wins the NFL championship. And that, those things are awesome, but they're not eternal. They're temporary. In heaven, nobody's going to care who won the Super Bowl in 2024. Is everybody tracking with me? I intend to win a national championship as a coach. I don't know what year that's going to happen. It will happen. When I die and go to heaven, I'm not taking the champ- I'm, I have a national championship trophy that I won. I don't get to take it into heaven. Everybody understand? Like, I'm not going to be like, hey, God, remember in 2019, whenever I won that national championship, like, can I, I I'm not bringing anything with me, but can I bring the trophy? Not going to matter. Not, not going to let me take it with me. A champion in the Hebrew is a man who stands in the gap on behalf of another man. And, and the importance of the definition is for you to get the revelation that you are called to be a man and a woman that stands in the gap on behalf of humanity. It might be between heaven and hell. It might be between brokenness and destiny. I don't know what it's going to be. Everybody's going through different things. There's some people I meet, I'm like, I got to help them get to their destiny. There's some people I meet, I'm like, they're broke. We've, we've got to put them back together. I pray all the time. Uh, me and my wife have five kids. We, we kind of run an open house because we don't really have a choice. It's just chaos. It's a circus all the time. But I pray that whenever people get in and around me, that if they didn't have a good home life or if they didn't have a good family life, that our home becomes an extension to them, that we become like family to them. We have a lot of people connected to us. And if they d- didn't grow up in a healthy home life, I want them to come into my environment, and I want them to experience a spiritual father a spiritual mother. I want to be that gap. I want to stand in that gap. Are you guys tracking with me? So people can see what a healthy marriage looks like, what it looks like to raise healthy kids. I want to stand in that gap and put a different mindset, a different belief in their mind. So God said this. First of all, he defined a champion as the man that stands in between the gap on behalf of, of, of humanity. So God, in the, in the Bible, he shows this story of David and Goliath. And the Philistines call out Goliath, and he's their champion. And the Israelites, they don't, they don't have a champion. Everybody's scared because Goliath is talking trash. So David arrives on the scene, and he, because he has the right belief and mindset, just makes the decision to stand in the gap on behalf of his people, which is how he became a champion. He wasn't trying to be a champion. He just showed up trying to serve some bread and milk. Just showed up trying to serve some bread and milk and made the decision in the moment because he was looking at his people and he was like, oh my God, this Goliath is taunting the armies of the living God. This should be. This is not the God I serve. I serve a way bigger God. This dude's big, but my God's way bigger. So when he arrives on the scene with the right belief and the right mindset, he gets put in the right position for promotion. When he arrives on the, on the scene with the right belief and the right mindset, he gets put in position for promotion. And we're going to talk about promotion a little bit tonight. I believe this. There's probably 10 to 20 doors of destiny that you will walk through throughout the course of your life or not walk through, and they're going to be the most important. There will be different moments, different decisions that you've got to make, but there's about 10 to 20 that are going to be critical. Me and my wife made a prayerful decision in December to turn down a healthy contract. Some people got in our way that are sitting up here. But, like, I didn't, I prayed and fasted about that decision because if I was like, if I make that decision, I am moving my kids and my family probably for the next 20 years. That's not a small decision. Like, I didn't sit down over coffee and talk to my boys about it. Like, eh, I wonder if I should transport my family you know, 35 hours away into a new environment. That's not like what I was praying, fasting, seeking God, seeking wine counselor. Are you guys tracking with me? 
He was doing the right thing, arrived on the scene, and because he had the right belief and the right mindset, he was prepared, prepared for a promotional moment. Ezekiel 22, 29 through 30 says this, For the people of the land practice extortion and commit robbery. They're doing bad things. They oppress the poor and the needy. They don't care about people. They're mistreating the foreigners, denying them justice. This is the scripture that I've built my life on, verse 30. I look for someone among them who would build up a wall and stand in the gap on behalf of the land. So I would not destroy it. I was looking for one man. And he said, I couldn't find one. I found no one. I was looking for one man. One Christian that would pray, that would fast, that would tell somebody about Jesus, that would care whenever somebody else was broken and hurting, that would show up and serve. David just showed up. He was serving his brothers. One man to stand in the gap. One one person that's not narcissistically just thinking about themselves. He's looking for one man and he can't find him. This is your call. This isn't like, oh, Coach Bush coaches and coaching has to do with championships, so he was going to come up with a catchy title. This has to do with how God breaks down a person, breaks you off of you, breaks your narcissism, breaks all your selfish ambition, all your self-reliance off of you so that he can build you into a champion. And a champion can't think about himself. David couldn't arrive on the scene and think, ah, I may die. All he could think was like a champion. I'm standing in the gap on behalf of my people, and I'm not going to let him go. This one I'll win in the name of God. Galatians 6.2 says this, carry each other's burdens. The greatest thing you can carry in this lifetime is is another man's burden. I am convinced of it. The greatest thing you can do is lose yourself and carry another man's burden. Because to do it, you've got to not think about who? You. Yourself, maybe, but because who and you rhyme, I'm going to go with you. But good answer, whoever said. You can't think about you. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. You know, it's funny because it was just like, hey, you want to fulfill the law? Stand in the gap on behalf of other people. Carry their burden. Religion gets funky because it exalts man. And Jesus, whenever he's communicating, he's communicating to a bunch of Pharisees and scribes that don't really care about people, but they're going to church every Sunday, doing everything in a super clean manner. Like everything looks super clean and super awesome. But really, whenever they get called on to stand in the gap on behalf of other people, they don't really care. There's no compassion in their heart. There's no willingness to serve. They don't care if people are going to heaven and hell. They don't care about serving their brother. They don't care if they're broken and in need of a word of encouragement or a moment of ministry. Point number one, God loves a small start. So the last two series prep this one. Wherever you're at right now, you guys are young adults. You're starting small. If you're in here and you're a millionaire, you have messed up my message. Like if you've made it, if you've made it, uh, this is going to be a bad message for you. You probably shouldn't leave. Uh, there's going to be no impact, except it's the word. Zechariah 4.10 says this, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. Uh, re- God rejoices in your small. See, you, what you don't understand about small, everybody wants to do the big thing for God. Nobody wants to do the small thing. What you don't understand about small is like God sees the small thing that you do behind the scenes and he's like rejoicing. He's cheering. He's like, yes, they got it right. Why? Because, because faithfulness, faithfulness in the Greek means multiplication. That's what it means. It means to produce multiplication. That's literally what it means. Like as you're faithful, you're what? You're producing multiplication. Where? In the spiritual, before it manifests where? Into the natural. Is everybody tracking with me? Everybody wants to do the big thing for God. Nobody wants to do the small things that create high-level multiplication. Whenever David arrived on the scene, he was prepared for promotion. I'm going to get you there. 1 Samuel 5.17 says this, And Samuel said, Although you were once small in your own eyes, 
He's talking to Saul, right? You, you guys know who Saul was. So Saul was the king at the time. David was getting ready to be the king. When you were small in your own, when you didn't think that you were big time in your own eyes, you became big. Have you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The, uh, the Lord anointed you as king over Israel. Now Saul's big time and Samuel's getting ready to tell him that he's going to lose the kingdom because he stopped being faithful in what? That which is small. It never ends. The small things that you do behind the scenes always prepare for God to do the big things in front of the scene. Uh, killing Goliath was a big thing in front of the scene. The question is, how did David get there? Why did he get there? Why was he prepared for promotion? So yes, do I want to prepare you for promotion? Yes, because I believe a bigger stage gives you a bigger voice. You can impact more people. Is it the number one point of this message? No. I want you to be a champion for Christ. I want you to be a person that has an attitude, a mindset, and a belief that you're going to stand in the gap on behalf of your friends, that you're going to get up early and pray, that you're going to fast, that you're going to speak the word of God over the people sitting next to you, that you're going to care more about their burdens than you're going to care about the, their burdens. This is the attitude and the mentality that set Christ apart. He was all about you, which is the opposite of being all about me. And most people's issues are because they're all about them. They're always thinking about them. The greatest freedom that you can ever have in your lifetime is this discipline, to just not think about you. Think about how easy your life would be if you just weren't thinking about you. Think about how easy your life would be if you just weren't thinking about you. If you surrendered your entire life to Christ and just lived your life for others. It's almost like the message of the gospel or something. God wrote Genesis, right? A small beginning. Spoke some things into existence. This is important. It interacts with the next part of my message, so pay attention. He spoke things into existence. But right at the beginning of Genesis, there wasn't much going on. He spoke some land, some water, some, some Adam, some Eve into existence. Spoke some things into existence. It was the beginning of a small thing, yes? Eight billion people later, maybe close to the end of a big thing. I'm not telling you that the world's coming to an end because I don't think that we're close. I think that if you were alive in World War II, you'd be like, oh, my God, the world's crazy. I think that if you're alive in 2024 and you're like, the world's crazy, I think you should have been alive during World War II, but whatever. I can tell you this. I don't know when the world's coming to an end, and everybody that tells you that it's closed, they don't know, so I don't know why they're saying it, because Jesus said man won't know. God loves a small thing. Do you? And if you can answer that question, it will change your mindset. It will change your life. If you love being faithful in a small thing, it will change your life. 1 Samuel 17, 33 says this, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine. So we're in a different place now. Saul, who is king, looks at David. Who, who Saul thinks he's big time now. He looks down at David, and he was like, Saul's the king. Are you guys tracking with me? And clearly not ready to fight the, the Goliath. He's scared. He's a scaredy cat. Because he doesn't know God. And we're getting ready to see that. He says, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war. Uh, uh, you need a hater. Everybody needs a hater. Everybody, I'm telling you, haters are the best. They're like, you know whenever you have relational conflict, you're getting ready for promotion. Every time. I can't take you right now in the word, but I'm just telling you. It's all over the word. It, the tapestry of the word of God is in, in incredible. I was, I was coaching a women's soccer team, and... I got all my scholarship money cut, and we built a really good team. And we'd beat, beaten a bunch of good schools. And the job came open on the men's side, and I was like, I'm going to go do that. And they were the worst college soccer program in the country. And right before I got ready to walk into the locker room, and I was starting to get job offers, big ones. Uh, and, and women's soccer plays, pays more than men's soccer uh, for whatever reason. Uh, because, like, the Big 12 and stuff, was, they, were, they were on the hunt. Um, 
and I might have been hunting them back a little bit. Like I, I had, I had my, my eyes on some stuff. But he was like, I was getting ready to walk into the locker room to introduce myself to my new team. And the last thing I heard from my boss is you're getting ready to commit job suicide. Are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, are you the bot? Like, you hired me? This is confusing. Like, this is like, hey, I want to marry you, but I really don't. Like, I, I'm, I'm. It'd be like if Rachel got to the altar and she was like, psych, like, I'm out. I'm just kidding. It sounded cool, but you might get heavier and more bold at one moment, and I don't, I don't know if I'm in for all that. I was, like, looking at him. I'm like, what? I thought you were in. You hired me. Now you're not. Now I'm committing job suicide. Like, who says that? Like, I'm getting, ready to, I'm getting ready to walk in and give, like, the, hey, this is where the program's. And the first thing I said to him, is, I was like, we're 206 out of 206. And I said, we're getting ready to build a top 25 program. Right after I heard, you're getting ready to commit job suicide. What was the first thing I said? To the guys? We're getting ready to build a top 25 program. What did my boss tell me? Are you sure you want to do this? You're getting ready to commit job suicide. Now think about David. David's like, yeah, let's go. I'm ready to go fight Goliath. I don't have the resources. I don't have the power. I don't have the physical prowess. I don't have the skill. I don't have the know-how. I don't have a bit. I can't even lift the, the spear that he's lifting. I'm not even strong enough to lift it. I don't have the physical resource to do it. And Saul, the hater, propelled him to greatness. The problem is, is whenever you hear negative things, which most of the time will come in, it come in your mind, it propels you downward. Because the first thing you say is so important. The first thing you say whenever something happens is so important. It is going to set the tone. They walked in my office one day, and they were like, you've just lost seven and a half scholarships. This was like 10, 12, 15 years ago. I don't know what it was. For a moment, I had a bad moment. I was like, oh, I'm about to cut some players. Like, I don't know what I'm about to do. People are about to hate me. But the very next thing I said was, we're getting ready to build a big-time program. That was while I was coaching the girls. That was the first thing I said. I want to know what the first thing you say is whenever something negative pops into your mind, whenever you're in a situation. David's testimony gave him the power and confidence he needed. Revelations 12, 11 says this. I would write that down. His, tes- his personal testimony. And they overcame, Revelations 12, 11 says this, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. But they did, not, they did not love their lives to death. How did they overcome? By the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And 1 Samuel 17, 37 says this. The Lord, David, says, David said this whenever he responded to Saul. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. I'm trying to put this in order for you. This is, how David, this is how David responded to Saul. Whenever he heard something negative in his mind, I, just so you know, the Goliaths you're going to fight are in your heart. They are in your promised land. They're not going to appear tangible. That's why I'm talking about the voice in your mind, the negative voice in your mind that's always telling you you're not enough, that things aren't going to work out for you, that your chance is never going to come, that you're never going to meet your husband, that you're never going to get the job, that you're never going to get the promo- promotion, that you're less than enough. That's the voice that I'm talking about. Is everybody dragging with me? Saul is not going to show up in your world and become the hater most of the time. They may. It may come in the form of a teacher or coach or something else. The Paul the lion and the Paul the bear will rescue me from from the hands of the Philistines. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. The Lord who rescued me from the Paul the lion. This is how he responded. From the Paul the lion and the Paul the bear. What was that? It was his testimony. And whenever you're faithful in small, this is why I talk about journaling all the time, because whenever you're faithful in small things and you pray through things and things come to pass and you write them down and you date them, they become your what? Their testimony. And David said, I became wiser than all my brethren 
because I meditated on the testimony that God did in my own life. Psalms 119. This is what he said. God built wisdom, practical application on the inside of him because he was meditating on the things that God did for him. David arrived on the scene and all he could think about was, I couldn't have killed that bear and that lion. I didn't have the skill to do that. So whenever Saul said, hey, you're a youth, you're just a child, you're not ready to take on Goliath. He said, this is my testimony. And this is how I overcome. By the blood of the lamb, by the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and the fact that I have, pray, I have been faithful in that which is small. I have been faithful in that which is small. And what multiplied, what was multiplying in the spiritual is about to manifest itself into the natural. In the place of promotion. It's a small testimony that's going to bring you a big victory. Write it down. David's preparation produced separation in his life. How was he prepared? On the side of a mountain, alone, taking care of sheep, before he took care of humanity. Just being faithful in that which is small. When he went to work, he didn't steal the pen. When he went to work and the boss was mean, he wasn't a quitter. He didn't quit. He didn't quit. Do you understand what it's like whenever you have all these brothers and the, the king is coming from your lineage and they have a party to pick the king, and you don't even get called to the party. God is not weighing out people's opinion of you whenever he is picking and choosing when to promote you. He does not care what man's opinion is. David's own father thought lowly of him. God did not care. God was weighing David's heart. And his faithfulness and the decisions that he made, day by day by day, was just being faithful. And that which was monotonous to us sometimes. That's why I said just not still in the pen from the office. Just being faithful in that which is small. My boss is a meanie head. I get it. They made a 32 on their ACT, and I made a 14. I get it. I was the 14. It was, school was hard on me. I still got three master's degrees. I, I do have a valedictorian in my family. I had, I've, I've got like six degrees. He's got one. I'm not trying to be competitive and, and weird, but I beat him with my 14 on my ACT. And I like to win stuff. That's just, that has nothing to do with the math. That was pride. That was pride. <laughs> I'll probably get humbled. I'll probably get on a volleyball team after this and get destroyed and some girl will probably jump up in the air and spike the ball on my head and bloody my nose or something. He understood the power in the name of the Lord. You guys know that God gave man dominion, and whatever he did, he gave him the purpose of, like, naming the animals. He was like, you have dominion over the animals. And what, what, uh, what Adam, what, what man did, whenever they were naming the animals, is they didn't just name them flippantly. I haven't named any of my kids flippantly, me and my wife. We've prayed about every single kid. We had a massive fight on my first child because I knew that he was supposed to be Ryan Paul II, and she wouldn't let me name my first child after him. So I did what any growing tough man would do. I called Pastor Bill, and I told on her. And we had a meeting, and whenever we left the meeting, Rachel was like, okay, we can... She got in the van, and she was like, we should probably name him Ryan Paul II. I was like, I'm glad you're hearing from the Holy Spirit, finally. But, like, when, 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 when Adam saw the lion, he described him. He didn't just name him. He gave him a description. He saw the lion, and he was like, king of the jungle. Why is the lion the king of the jungle? If, if a 70-pound lion and a 70-pound tiger got in a fight, the tiger would win every time. Every time. Because they have more mass in their lower extremities. But why is the lion, who would always lose to a same size tiger in an individual fight, the king of the, king of the jungle? What was Adam describing whenever he named the lion or man?
he understood something spiritually. If five lions and five tigers got in a fight, the five lions would win every time because the tigers would turn against each other. Why is the lion the king of the jungle? Why should Christians look different? Why should they be different? It was spiritually smart. Ha, the lion, the king of the jungle. Man, whenever they get together, whenever lions travel in packs, nothing can come against them. 1 Samuel 17, 45 through 46 says this, David replied to the Philistines, you come to me with a sword of spirit and a javelin, but I come to you in what? The name of the Lord. And then he described him. What's the first thing you say whenever a situation happens? Because this is what David said. Goliath, you are talking trash. You've got a cool big spear and an AK-47. You've got cool stuff. You've got an atom bomb, an atomic bomb, and I've got God, and this is his name. When you pray, you pray in what? The name of Jesus. That's good, Josiah. I taught him something since he converted from being Baptist. If you're here and you're Baptist, I apologize. I, I like the Baptist. You come to me with a, a sword, a spear, a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, not me, and I will kill you and I will cut off your head. In the King James it says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The Hebrew word for host is a massive warfare. I come to you in the name of the Lord who's a massive, who's a massive warfare. A massive warfare is getting ready to come at you because I'm speaking the name of Jesus. Am I making it tangible? Can you guys see it? The God of the armies, the armies in Hebrew, a battle array that is set in order to fight. There is a mass warfare that is set in order coming to fight you in the spiritual that you cannot see because I'm coming to you in the name of Jesus. What's the first thing he said? Because you're going, to get, you're going to get in situations where you've got to say something. This is the ultimate level of faith. It's called authority. Authority is the next level of faith. Whenever you can declare a thing and you know it's going to come to pass. Now, you go around declaring Lamborghinis. Uh, God said, you pray, you ask a miss, and you're being dumb, forget it. I'm out. He declared the name of the Lord. And who won the battle? When the test came, the first thing David said was the most important thing. Does everybody agree? Thank you. I'm glad you guys agree with the Bible. You guys are killing it. Luke 4, 5 through 8 says this. Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted by Satan. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment's time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me. And I will give it, Jesus, to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will bow down and worship me, all this can be yours. And Jesus said to him, it is written inside of the word of God, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord, your God, and serve him only. What did Jesus Christ do whenever he was tempted by the enemy? Immediately, he said something. And what did he say? Somebody said it. He spoke scripture back. What did David say? You come to me with an AK-47, an atomic bomb, a spear, a javelin, and I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, in the name of Jesus. The name that is above every name. You have named some things. You have named it a spear, a javelin, a big shield. You've named it a Goliath, a giant, name it whatever you want. I'm coming, you with a, I'm coming to you with a bigger name. The name that is above all the other names that you're naming. And David had faith in that. And David won. He was prepped for promotion. All the faithfulness that he did behind the scenes, doing the small things, all of those things that were multiplying in the spiritual in one moment came to fruition in the natural. Killed the bear, the lion, nobody was there. One of the rewards for passing God's test is the next test. 
Because the next test brings a harder test, but a greater reward. You kill the lion, there's always a reward. Killed the bear, there's always a reward. The greatest reward, he hadn't seen yet. He hadn't seen himself kill Goliath yet. God was prepping him for promotion. He was prepping him in small things, in small moments, doing small things behind the scenes in a faithful way. Faithfulness is what? In the Greek, multiplication. As he was faithful in that which is small, God was multiplying things in the spiritual. And all of a sudden, in one moment, in one moment, 2 Corinthians 4.13 says this, And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore we speak. What do we speak? The word of God. David spoke the, he spoke the name that's above all names. Do you really believe that speaking the word of God does things, that it matters? How would you have faith without words if faith comes by hearing? And faith is released how? Is this how you release faith? By Speaking, good. I was wondering if like the scripture impacted you guys at all. The one that said, I believed and therefore I spoke. All right, good. Proverbs 18.21 says this, death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat of its fruit. The testimony that you're building today is creating your inflection point for tomorrow. Write it down in your heart. Because if there's no faithfulness, there's no multiplication. And if there's no multiplication... There's no inflection point, and they're all over the word. The, the stock market did not make up an inflection point. God did. David slung the stone. The Goliath fell over. That was his inflection point. He had two or three. He took off. Multiplication, there were things in the spiritual. God was weighing his heart. God saw the decisions that he made, why he, well, why he made them. He saw his faithfulness. He saw the spirit behind his decisions. He saw that he loved people. He saw that he cared people. He saw that he was willing to die for people. Was he willing to die? He arrived on the scene. Everybody else was scared. Everybody else was in fear. And he stepped right out. And he said, I'll go fight this man. And Saul was like, you're just a kid. And he said, no. I've got the name of Jesus. I've got the name that's above all names. I've been faithful in that which is small. God's going to make me ruler over so much more. God will always lead us not obviously and paradoxically. Why is it not obvious? Because it's going to demand faith. Why is it paradoxical? Because the small things will always equate into the big things. Whatever it is that you're involved in and engaged in right now, there's going to be moments where you've got to speak to things. You've got to open up your mouth and tell things what they're going to be. And they need to align with God's word. And you're going to have to be faithful in small things because that's going to produce multiplication. So then whenever you arrive on the scene and God's ready to do the big thing, you're going to understand that it was never you at all. It's God's job to do the big thing in your life, and he will. If you're faithful, if, 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 if. Everybody's, telling, everybody's talking about God and what God wants to do, but nobody's talking about the how. It's going to happen because it's not going to happen for everybody. It's going to demand your obedience. It's going to demand you open up your mouth. It's going to demand that you know the word so that you can speak the word. It's going to demand both your faith and your faithfulness. It's going to, believe, it's going to demand your belief and your mindset. It's going to demand your heart. Eventually, as you climb spiritually, you're going to realize that it just demands all of you. That if you can get to the place where you're just never thinking about you, it'll be the most freeing place in the world. And right now, you think that you've got to think about all of you all the time. And it's the most enslaved place that you can live. The greatest thing you can ever do is surrender your entire life to Jesus Christ. The author and perfecter of your faith. The author of the process that he wants to take you through. The author of your inflection points. The author of all things. God, I thank you for this night. I thank you for this moment. I thank you for your word that it never returns void, God, that it accomplishes everything that it's set out to do, Father. We thank you, God, just so much for your word. We thank you, God, for your integrity, Father, that you honor your word. 
that you're a man of your word, that we can trust God, that whenever we obey, that your word will come to pass every single time, God, that you are integrous, that your word demands integrity, that you're not a man that you should lie. We love you so much. Repeat this prayer after me, God, and say it like you mean it. I give you my life. I make Jesus Christ my Lord and my Savior. Set me apart. Make me a man or a woman who will stand in the gap on behalf of other men. God, I give you my life. I surrender all to you. Build me into a champion. In Jesus' name, amen.